Is China set to become the world's next great military superpower? Some might argue that's already the case. While the United States still leads the way in annual military spending, $877 billion was pumped into the US military in 2022 alone, China is still firmly in second place. And while its spending of $292 billion might seem like pocket change in comparison to the US's mighty military machine, often it's how you use the military budget, not the size that counts. You see, China isn't necessarily preparing for an all-out war with anybody. Instead, it's spending to support those who align with its political agenda, combined with several discrete military movements that all seem to be leading China to achieving global political supremacy. But what are those discrete military movements exactly? And perhaps more importantly, how does China's approach to its military funding set the stage for its development into the most powerful political player in the world? To answer those questions, we need to take a deeper dive into China's military strategy, starting with the country's biggest weapon of all, nukes. According to Newsweek, the country has stockpiled an impressive 500 nuclear warheads, all operational, for its own protection. And while this is dwarfed by the stockpiles held by the Russians and the United States, with both reportedly having 5,000 nuclear warheads each, the fact that China has jumped from 400 to 500 warheads between 2020 and today suggests the country is actively looking to make itself a bigger nuclear threat on the world stage. Anybody who lived through the Cold War knows precisely why. Mutually assured destruction. In the 20th century, the Soviet Union and the US found themselves embroiled in a cold conflict that never resulted in the two nations fighting directly but it did involve them supporting many other nations and movements designed to enhance their own political strength. The only reason the Soviet Union and America didn't come to blows back then was because each packed a nuclear arsenal so massive they could destroy the entire world. The Soviets send a nuke, America responds with one of its own, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. At least if the initial nuclear blast didn't blind you already. Having already seen the protective impact that having a nuclear arsenal can have, China has likely upped its nuke production significantly in recent years because of the political strength that comes from being a nuclear nation. Now China has the power to exert itself more openly on the global stage because it has the firepower to back its actions up. And while we can all hope that the days of mutually assured destruction are behind us, there is no denying it's a powerful negotiating tool to bring to the table, power that China intends on exploiting. The rise in nuke production is far from the only military strengthening that China has been doing though. As little as 20 years ago, China was seen as the factory to the world. It's where many powerful nations went to get goods manufactured. But its military, though large, was disorganized and relied on massively outdated equipment. Over the last two decades, this has drastically changed. China has engaged in a modernistic military movement, essentially upgrading its forces every year. In fact, China's military budget increased by about 10% per year for every year between 2000 and 2016 resulting in it spending more on its armed forces than any other nation other than the US. And that money has been used very well. According to Major General Cameron Holt, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, China is buying up military equipment at a rate that outstrips the United States by a ratio of up to 6 to 1. Yes, the US is still spending more, a lot more, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's getting more and better equipment. In fact, Major General Holt believes that China spends $1 for every 20 the US spends to acquire equipment with the same capabilities. Using that as a basic ratio, we can multiply China's $292 billion in 2022 spending by 20 to see that the US would have to spend $5.84 trillion per year to keep up with China's current military budget. So China might be spending less, but the money it has goes a lot further. So much so that it's actually receiving far more equipment for what it spends than the supposed biggest military spenders in the world. That money isn't just going to nukes, it's being spent on training, diversifying its ballistic missiles collection, aircraft, boats, and so much more. In short, China's packing a huge amount of equipment because it knows that strengthening its military is the fastest and perhaps best way to get respect on a global scale. The question is simple. What does it hope to achieve with that military respect? That's where the politics of China's military spending come into play. And the answer isn't simple. But we can start with something the US always assumed China wanted to achieve, regional supremacy. In a 2020 article published in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace website, foreign policy experts Jake Sullivan and Hal Brands argued that China has two paths to achieve global domination. The first and most likely path China will take 
is to build regional supremacy through its military, with that supremacy acting as a foundation for later military efforts. You can see this approach being attempted by Putin and his attempted annexation of Ukraine in 2022. He wants Ukraine because having it gives him and Moscow more territory. By having more territory, Russia would have more places to build bases, station soldiers, and generally act as a threat to those near its borders. China might be preparing to use a similar approach in the Western Pacific. Sullivan and Brand suggest that this is the approach that Western powers assume China is taking. By strengthening its military, it puts itself in a position to seize territory in the Western Pacific, which runs from Japan to the Philippines. With its stronger military and the previously mentioned nukes, dissuading other nations from intervening as it builds power. By taking over countries in the region, China could also potentially destroy relationships that the US has in the region, eroding America's position as China strengthens its own. It seems like a plausible approach to building a global political power. And it should. It is the very approach that the United States has leveraged to become the superpower it is today. We see Russia trying to do it in modern times. Tellingly, almost every major political power in history has taken the approach of strengthening its military to capture territory and become ever more powerful. There are hints that China may follow the same path, at least to some degree. Its People's Liberation Army, or PLA, is rapidly building a presence near Taiwan, with the potential goal of subjugating the island nation entirely, an act that would upend the global political status quo by serving as a direct challenge to the friendly though unofficial relationship that the US shares with Taiwan. Additionally, China has spent the last few years investing heavily in not just nukes, but quiet submarines, anti-ship missiles, and high-tech air defenses, all ways to warn the US and others that they'll be met with a nasty reception should they encroach on China's current borders or those it might expand to in the future. This country also isn't shy about demonstrating its might to its neighbors that it feels might be a threat or those that it simply wishes to subjugate. Coming back to the PLA's growing presence near Taiwan, it looks like China is taking a slow-squeeze approach to the territory it believes it owns. In fact, reports out of Taiwan indicate that China spent much of 2023 strengthening the military bases it already maintains on the coastline facing Taiwan. A September 2023 report in AP News highlights the scale of this strengthening. Taiwan spotted 20 warships and 22 planes near the island in the space of 24 hours. That military posturing extends to Japan, China's oldest military rival. Japan's Defense Minister Minoru Kihara has already expressed dismay at China's rapid military buildup throughout Asia, going so far as to call Japan's trilateral military exercises with the United States and South Korea the cornerstone of its response to China's actions. For its part, China is making interesting claims about how Japan is taking more offensive approaches to its military, one that suggests China could undermine regional stability. It's gaslighting on a global scale. Those who keep up to date with Asian politics will be familiar with the cycle. China engages in military posturing intended to threaten Taiwan and Japan. When those countries respond by trying to flex their own fighting forces, China not only downplays its own actions, but cleverly suggests that it's Japan and Taiwan that are threatening to disrupt peace in Asia. This approach shows us it's not just military might that'll pave the way to regional dominance for China. This is the second path that Jake Sullivan and Hal Brands mentioned, the more carrot part of the carrot and stick approach. China has more insidious tricks up its sleeve other than its military might, tricks that depend less on direct aggression and more on leveraging political intelligence and jingoistic patriotism to achieve its goals. Take China's President Xi Jinping and his Asia for Asians mantra. On the surface, it seems relatively harmless. The Belt and Road Initiative BRI, for instance, has the stated goal of seeing China work together with other Asian nations to massively improve infrastructure. Those efforts are supported by the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank AIIB, which often funds those projects with loans. All seems above board, right? In fact, it sounds like something that could benefit a lot of nations that are poorer than China. But poorer is the operative word here. Those nations don't have the money to complete these infrastructure improvements alone. Instead, they rely on loans from China, with hundreds of them being given out since the BRI initiative started. Study the fine print, and you'll see language that restricts the nations that sign for those loans from seeking additional loans or restructuring from the so-called Paris Club, 22 of the world's biggest creditor nations. You won't be surprised to see the United States is in that club. There are also clauses that give China the ability to demand repayment at any point, whether the nation has the funds or not, potentially leading to some serious debt problems. If you're getting images of mafia loan sharks floating around in your head, you're not too far away from the reality of the situation. But what does all this have to do with the Chinese military? Picture this scene. 
Country A accepts a loan from China as part of the BRI initiative. That loan covers the construction of a road running through the country, a great trade route, but also a potential transportation route that certain military could use. China knows that, so they ask for repayment when Country A isn't ready to provide it. With no money to pay back the loan, Country A is left indebted to China and in a position where it faces immense pressure from its creditor. It's not beyond the realms of possibility then that China could do something like insist having a military base built in Country A as an alternative form of payment. Suddenly, China has increased its regional power and gained advantageous positioning for its military without spilling a drop of blood. But what about those nations that won't crumble to China's demands for repayment? Well, China now has a reason to use its military to obtain more direct control of an asset that it funded. It's a very clever approach. On one hand, China is building a military and will potentially start claiming territory in the traditional ways that fueled the growth of the US, Russia, and so many nations that came before. But it's backing up that with political maneuvering, taking advantage of its vast wealth to potentially place regional territories in so much debt that they have no choice but to allow Chinese incursion based on little more than a whim. But there is even more. While China is potentially setting up other Asian nations to fall with the BRI project, it's more actively trying to build alliances through military aid donations. Again, this is nothing new. The US, the UK, and several other Western nations are currently donating a lot of money to Ukraine in its fight against Russia, and it's likely the US will provide aid to Israel as its war against Hamas escalates. Additionally, China spends a lot less in this department than the US, according to RAND. According to RAND, China's military aid spending topped out at $560 million between 2013 and 2018, a period in which the United States donated $35 billion. So, small fries from China in the grand scheme of things. But it doesn't change the fact that China is using these donations to curry favor with nations in potentially advantageous positions. With much of its money going toward countries in Asia and Africa, Cambodia is the biggest recipient of China's generosity. Having received $115 million in the previously mentioned 2013-2018 to period. Of course, it's purely coincidental that this aid happened to come at a time when its pro-China Prime Minister at the time, Hun Sen, faced mounting opposition from the more liberal and thus Western-aligned Cambodian National Rescue Party CNRP. The CNRP was forcefully dissolved in 2018. Hun Sen maintained power and today has essentially passed the baton to his son Hun Manet who is maintaining a strong relation with China, and now you see China's military aid strategy in a different light. The country is essentially funding a dictator, one who will act in China's interests if and when the time comes. Building on the aid to Cambodia, China's also donated large amounts of money and equipment to several countries in the African Union, as well as countries like Sri Lanka, Nepal, the Philippines, and Afghanistan. The latter is especially interesting. China has engaged the ruling Taliban party in Afghanistan several times, though this is done more out of necessity than desire. If China had its way, the turmoil that exists in the country would disappear, ideally under the leadership of a party that's sympathetic to China, meaning there'd be less instability on its borders. Right now, it seems happy to appease the Taliban with money, including a $37.4 million donation made in 2022 to quell potential terroristic activity near the China-Afghanistan border. And it's not just money that China is donating, it's weapons. Donating might be too strong a term here, as China is just as likely to sell as it is to simply give weapons to other countries. But it's not above helping nations that align with its political agenda, as we've seen in the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. In April 2023, the Washington Post reported on a set of documents leaked on Discord that showed China had apparently agreed to the provision of lethal aid to Russia, with the documents going on to detail China's plan to disguise this equipment as civilian items, adding a layer of secrecy to its donations. Any doubt that this is happening seemed to disappear the very same month when Reuters reported that Ukrainian fighters were finding more and more Chinese components in captured Russian weapons. All of this points to a country that's willing to use what it has to strengthen ties with potentially useful allies and weaken countries it views as a threat. So there are politics at play behind every military donation China makes. And though the exact nature of those politics varies depending on the nation receiving the money, the end goal is the same. Keep these smaller nations happy with money so they'll be supportive of China's situation. We're even seeing the fruits of some of these donations come to bear. For instance, China has managed to create a military base in Djibouti, 
located in the Horn of Africa, which gives the country a crucial foothold at a time when it's using the BRI initiative to build more and more infrastructure on the African continent. And according to a report by Air Data, published on The Guardian in July 2023, the U.S. believes China is likely to build more overseas military bases in the future. Gwadar in Pakistan is a likely candidate, as is Bata in Equatorial Guinea and Hambantota, a Sri Lankan town. The report even emphasizes the investment of China's state-owned banks into several port projects in those regions as evidence of this being a likely outcome. In short, China's using its diplomatic ties to strengthen its global and, most importantly, naval presence, likely aiming to rival the U.S. in terms of its military might stationed overseas. Each base enhances China's foothold in the region, giving it a platform from which the country could conceivably launch attacks. But it hasn't stopped there. China's holding joint naval drills with other countries, such as the drill it performed with Russia and Iran in the Gulf of Oman in March 2023. It shows it's using soft power projection tactics. Yes, those drills serve to strengthen its alliances with the nations with which it holds, but there's also a clear message behind them. We have allies and we're not afraid to work with them. These joint military exercises are also indicators of trust between China and the other countries. Great news for those countries, which get to showcase that they have a powerful military ally. Far more worrying for countries that could be on the other side of the fence should China decide to start the war. Another example comes from China's naval visits to some of the countries it wants to build a stronger tie with. Take the overseas trek to the Republic of Congo in August 2023. China arrived at the Point Noir port with an impressive fleet of warships, not to demonstrate dominance over the Congo, but to reinforce its friendship with the nation. These friendship visits are becoming increasingly common, and again China is using them to strengthen political ties while subtly delivering its message to potential opposing forces. We have a lot of friends and we're building our presence in many regions. Now let's change tack. So far we focused on China's militaristic machinations on a global scale, building a stockpile of weapons to bolster its defense, supporting smaller nations with aid to curry their favor for whatever the future might hold, and in a very sneaky move lending money to many countries as a part of a seemingly benevolent project but only to have that money come with so many strings attached that China need only pull one to leverage its financial muscle and achieve its territorial ambitions. But it's also worth looking closer to home. It's impossible to build a house without creating a solid foundation on which to support it. And it's also impossible for China to strengthen its global political power without a base from which to act. While it's easy to look at China's military expansion from the perspective of what it might do on the global stage, you can't underestimate the important role this renewed military plays closer to home. To China's leaders, especially President Xi Jinping, a powerful military is as much a domestic status symbol as a means to protect China from its enemies or prepare for attacks against them. Having a strong army means being seen as strong on the world stage, but it also means a greater capacity for whipping up patriotic fervor around that strength. And again, this is hardly a new tactic. Millions of people in the United States take great pride in their military, often attending events dedicated to celebrating the men and women who defend their country. Military pride exists. You can see this with the pure vitriol with which many who commit stolen valor, claiming to have served in the military when they haven't, are met with. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that China's leaders are trying to inspire those same feelings of fervent patriotism in their own people, and it's actively using its military to encourage that patriotism. Lavish military parades are a regular sight in Beijing, and many of the country's military exercises, such as its sorties over the Taiwan Strait, are covered extensively by Chinese media. The military is something in which China's people can take pride. By playing up this fact and combining it with rhetoric on the need for defense, given the still recent memories of Japan's attacks on China during the Second World War, the country's leadership cements its position as protectors of an entire nation. That's a great domestic political trump card to have. In essence, Xi Jinping is keeping up appearances to tie militaristic patriotism to himself as a leader. It's no coincidence he's often seen in full military regalia, despite the fact that he has a limited track record of service himself. The constantly growing budget of China's military is a small price to pay for inspiring the loyalty Xi Jinping will need from the country's people should he ever follow through on what many believe is an inevitable display of China's power on the world stage. There's also another factor at play on the domestic level. China as a whole has a desire for global respect, and that desire stems from the many past humiliations the nation has suffered on the military front. Of course, we know about the horrors that China faced in its battles with Japan during World War II. 
with the Japanese essentially coming out on top in every conflict and only really being stopped by the dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But China's scars run even deeper, stretching all the way back to the 19th century in what historians have dubbed China's century of humiliation. During the 19th century, growing European influence in South and East Asia led to the dismantling of the China-centric power balance in the region. Tellingly, tech lay at the heart of this dismantling. Westerners simply had much better weapons. That increased military power made itself known during the First Opium War, in which China was soundly defeated and forced to cede Hong Kong to the British Empire for reparations. It didn't stop there. The 19th century brought losses from Russia, leading to China losing some of its northern territory, and Japan, with the latter coming out on top during the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895. These constant losses damaged the people's faith in the Qing Dynasty, which fell to a revolt in 1911 to pave the way for the establishment of the Republic of China. The point is simple. China spent a century, perhaps even a touch more, taking a beating on the global stage. By flexing its buying power and military might today, the country's leaders are playing on the still-present feelings of humiliation that many in China feel while re-establishing the country as a global superpower on the same level it was on before the century of humiliation. So given all this, will China overtake the US and become the new global hegemon? The first and most obvious thing to point out is that China isn't simply set to become the world's next great military superpower. It's already there. It spends more than any other country barring the US on its defenses. And if speculation about its purchasing power relative to the US is to be believed, it's getting more bang for its buck with every dollar spent. The result is a military twice the size of the United States, with 2.8 million active members. That when combined with the country's increasing nuclear power means that China has a heck of a card to play at the negotiating table. That growing military is already coming into play when we look at China's regional approach. The sorties taking place in the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea aren't just mere shows of power. China is demonstrating that it has trained to hold position and take territory in these potential military flashpoints. When combined with the Asia for Asians propaganda, supported by the loans and development work China is delivering to other countries, we see a nation that's taking a multi-pronged approach to securing regional power. If a show of strength alone won't cut it, luring other nations into forming near inescapable financial ties to China creates a situation where these countries are constantly on the precipice of going into debt. This leads to financial weakness, with China being perfectly placed to take advantage, should the time come. Still, we can't deny much of this is speculation. China's global political machinations all point to a country that's both consolidating its position and preparing to expand. But it hasn't engaged in active invasions yet. Instead, it seems to be playing a longer game, ensuring it has all the cards it needs on the table, domestically, regionally, and globally, before it finally reveals the hand it intends to play. One thing is for certain, it'll be interesting to see how China leverages its military might in the coming decade. And that leads us to ask what you think about China's approach. Do you see the country partaking in direct invasions in the near future, bolstered by its strong financial position? Or is China likely to sit back while slowly building its influence until it reaches a point where it becomes a regional superpower through financial muscle backed by its strong military? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Now watch why China is terrified of the US Navy, or check out this video instead.